Before we turn to our main presentation on summer and fall blooming perennials with Leslie and Elizabeth, our guest gardener, Mary Ellen, is going to tell us about this native perennial blooming in zone seven, Rose Morrow. It will be an attractive color for your butterfly garden or a rain garden. Over to you, Mary Ellen. Thank you, Linda. Walk along a lake or a pond in the Northern Virginia region this September, and perhaps you'll see Hibiscus miscutus, commonly called rose mallow, thriving in the moist, loamy soil. It's hard to miss the large, showy blooms. It's not only the human observer who's drawn to these beauties. Rose mallow attracts bird and insect pollinators, including hummingbirds, skippers, moths, butterflies, such as the native species painted lady, and the eastern swallowtail, as well as the larvae of moths and butterflies. An olifophagus, oligophagus, or rare specialized bee called the rose mallow bee, would struggle to survive without its partnership with this plant, which uses it as its sole source of pollen. This native perennial is easily grown in full sun and preferred conditions. Rose mallow plants grow in shrubby colonies with stems reaching a height of five to seven feet. When the colony grows large, it can be thinned out and divided for better air circulation to promote healthy growth. In the fall, it disperses seeds from the pods of established plants, advancing the spread. Sometimes seeding may even take place from the seed pods which float on the water until finding a good place to root ashore. Rose mallow is resourceful, however, and like many of our native plants, can thrive in less than ideal conditions, adapting to a somewhat drier soil and partial sun. Rose mallow is fairly disease resistant, but it's important to note that there are a few insect pests which chew holes in the leaves such as the Japanese beetle. Uncontrolled pests may eventually cause the leaves to develop sooty mold and drop. These pests are best controlled in the early stages by good cultural and mechanical practice. Wow, lots of great information. Here are um, Mary Ellen's references. Thank you, Mary Ellen, for that fabulous um, presentation uh, oh, what beautiful welcome. what beautiful native flowers for a par pollinating garden or along your back backyard pool good afternoon leslie thank you for starting our conversation on summer and fall blooming perennials toad lily will be our first of four flowers we will be discussing could you share some background on the showy exotic plant Sure. Yeah, I, I learned a lot about this plant. I'd never really seen one before, but I think they're really pretty. Um, they're native to Japan, so they are considered exotic. Um, they're, they're not native plants to here. Um, they're found in shady rocky cliffs and along streams and edges of forest. Um, it's, it's best to plant them where they can be seen. You don't want to plant them back in a cluster because the flowers are so pretty. So um, if you're gonna plant them, plant them along a walkway so when they bloom, they can, if people can look at the flowers. Um, it, it was hard to find these at one time, but now they're pretty common in the nurseries and um, they aren't considered in, invasive because they're not that easily spread. Oh, that's great. So Leslie, what are the growing conditions and characteristics of toad lily? Um, well, they grow from creeping rhizomes and they can be um, like one to three feet inches in, in height. They form like this arch um, of leaves first um, that emerges in the late spring. Um, and the, the leaves are in the latter formation and they're really pretty as a backdrop. Um, and you need um, well-drained soil. Uh, they don't like having wet feet. So, but you want um, shady borders. So, and woodland paths are a great place to 
to put them. Sounds nice. Leslie, could you describe the toad lily flowers? Sure, they have, um, they're called tepals, which are a combination between the petals and the leaves. Um, they have six showy tepals, and then they have um, a pouch at the bottom um, called a nectary. Um, and then the crown um, is formed from the stamens and the styles, and it forms this kind of floofy looking centerpiece. Um, it blooms now um, into uh, October and um, it's pollinated by uh, butterflies and provides nectar to hummingbirds. What a gorgeous flower. Are there some recommended uh, companion plants? Um, yeah, you, you can mix them with anemone, which we're going to talk about soon, um, astilbe, ferns, hellebores, hostas, lungwort, and trout lilies. Um, they're they're pretty deer resistant. Lily, um, lilies are considered toxic. So um, be careful if you have pets that like to chew on plants because it is toxic to cats and dogs. Um, and um, you can propagate them um, by division in the spring or seed and stem cuttings um, uh, or later in the season. So. And if you want sturdier plants, you, you want to trim them, the, the greenery down um, by half in late spring, and it supports the blooms a little bit better. That's a great idea. Leslie, what's the next flower that you'll be sharing with us today? We're going to talk about the uh, Japanese anemone. Um, it, it's also blooming around this time of year. Um, it's also called the windflower or thimble flower, um, and it's part of the buttercup family. Um, so uh, if you've ever had buttercups take over your yard, just a warning on that one. It's the ranunculaceae family. Um, it's actually a Chinese um, flower. Uh, I don't know how it got named the Japanese and then me. I think that's where it was <laughs> discovered, discovered. So. Um, and it's hardy in this zone. So, and it's, it's really pretty in the late summer and fall gardens. So, and it, it was a perennial plant association plant of the year in 2016. Leslie, could you share uh, with us some characteristics of the Japanese anemone? Sure, it, it forms the greenery first and it's real dense um, on the ground. Some of them are lighter green, a lot of them are darker green, um, and it, it makes this nice um, front, if you, pat, if you plant it in the front of your garden, it makes this nice little green um, planting. Um, and then uh, in the fall, the flowers come up, but they're on a really narrow stem, so they kind of float above um, the greenery. Um, so you can actually plant uh, it in the front and denser plants in the back and they show off um, very nicely. So, because the, the blooms are like three to four feet tall on a really narrow stem. Those are showy. Could you sh share with us uh, about the flower? Sure, um, they're, they're showy white flowers. Um, the buds are round and light pink on branching stems. And then the flowers are two to three inches wide, um, single to semi-double open face um, with six to nine overlapping tepals and yellow stamens in a crown. And then they have a really pretty chartreuse center. So there, there's a nice little circle, but like a green, green ball with a nice yellow circle of the um, stamens. And it looks like the bees enjoy them as well. Yes, they do. <laughs> I guess the honoring yo bear is a very popular flower. It's the white one. There's oh. also a nice pink one too. I have the pink one, yeah. Would this be a good choice for a cutting garden? It would be, yes. Um, it, you can cut them 
Um, it blooms past the first frost. Um, and again, the bees and butterflies love it. So yes, um, it, just remember it, it can be a bit aggressive. So you, once it's established, you need to take care that it's not taken over your garden. Thanks for that advice. Are there any insects or wildlife issues when growing these flowers? I think the rabbits like to eat it uh, in, when they're little, but other than that, no, not really. Um, just the sap can irritate some people. Um, and you wanna grow it in the morning sun on the Eastern side of the house and it has poor drought tolerance. So once it, but once it's established, it seems to do pretty well. Okay, mine are growing on the Eastern side of the house too. So I guess I made a good choice there. You made a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's see. These are all your references for toad lily and Japanese anemone. Um, if there's anything that you really um, like to focus on and point out to folks, um, go ahead. Um, I think the University of Wisconsin had a lot of, a, a pretty good article on the anemone. Um, I, yeah, I think that was most of it. And that for both the hairy toad lily and the, the uh, anemone, the University of Wisconsin was. They are a great source. She has a lot of great articles there. So, okay. All right, well, thank you, Leslie, for sharing all that wonderful information on the growing conditions and care of toad lilies and Japanese anemone. Elizabeth, welcome to our conversation. Thank you. I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, I can't see you, but... Um, but you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. So okay. um, welcome to our conversation as we continue our discussion on these summer and fall blooming perennials growing in zone seven. Elizabeth, could you share us uh, some of the growing uh, requirements for this old fashioned perennial? Well, first of all, Linda, hollyhock is a biennial. And although it is a type of perennial, it is a special perennial. First of all, it completes its life cycle over two years with the first year spent growing foliage and storing up energy. And then during the second year, the stalks spike up and the flowers bloom and then seeds form. So this is something you need to remember if you're going to get into growing hollyhocks. You're not going to feel the love right away. So and don't be discouraged. A, that's right. Um, <laughs> it's, all, it's, it's always a favorite and normally grown at the edge of gardens. They have enduring appeal with a wide variety of colors blue, pink, purple, red, white, yellow, and even a very, very dark purple that looks like black. That must be strong. So, um, the light requirements, full sun to part shade with at least six hours of sun a day. Great information. Can you tell us about the water requirements or any pest or disease issues when growing hollyhocks? Okay, one thing you need to remember is that hollyhocks need to be watered as they're becoming established. But once established, they are drought resistant. And there are some watering tips because of the plant pests that can occur. You water from below, avoid wetting the foliage as wet leaves can become diseased with fungal diseases. And to the right, you can see um, a, a rust that grows on hollyhocks. Um, so if you, if you watch the watering, it's not likely that you will develop rust. However, we all know that rust appears in the, in the drenching rains of August. So, um, this rust is not something that will kill the plant, but it is something that will cause these red colored blisters on the steep stems and the leaves. Hollyhocks need rich, moist, well-drained soil. And there are the usual pests, slugs, snails, spider mites, Japanese beetles, though they are deer resistant. All right, lots of great information. Are there any benefits to the wildlife or to the pollinators? 
Oh, yes. Um, the hollyhock is host, plant host, to the painted lazy butterfly caterpillar. And uh, you can see to the right a picture of the, the caterpillar, which kind of looks like a striped caterpillar. And then below, you'll see this very beautiful butterfly, painted lady butterfly. And um, they just amass on the hollyhock plants and makes them just a very lovely sight. They attract pollinators such as hummingbirds and bees as well. And um, if you're going to plant them in the in the landscape, they're particularly attractive on on the landscape edges. Use them as foundation plants because they grow to six to feet eight inches tall with a spread of one to two feet. They're really very large plants. And in the beginning, when you're you're planting your seed, seedlings, plant them. 12 to 18 inches apart. Some trusted cultivars are Scarlet Eye, Peaches and Cream, and Cream de Cassis. All great suggestions, thank you. So are there any recommended companion plants? Um, there, since hollyhocks are leggy and have spindly stems, you want to plant some plants that are shorter companions in front. And these include dahlia, clematis, shrub rose, baby's breath, black-eyed Susan, phlox, sweet William, and climbing roses. And if you, um, I, if we could, well, I guess we can't refer to the first slide, but there was a picture of the hollyhocks growing behind some climbing roses. Oh, let me see um, if I can go back. Right, right here? There you go. There, there they are. There are the hollyhocks. So, and you see believe below all of those bloom, and they do bloom from bottom to top, you have spindly stems, so you want something to cover them up. But um, back to what needs to be done for hollyhocks, they are large plants and they need to be, be pruned. Deadhead, when the, deadhead the flowers when they fade and cut back the stems after flowering has ended. This will, this will prevent seeds from forming and reseeding if you want to keep them in a certain area and confine their, go their growth. Normally, you would have to replant the, seed, the, the plants for the following spring. But to have seeds set for the next spring, leave the flowers and a few stalks until a few seeds have dropped. And as, fall, as you're doing your fall cleanup, remove the stems and leaves to prevent rust disease from overwintering. Great tips, and I really like those ideas for those companion plants. What's the next perennial that you'll be sharing with us today? Okay, it will be New England Aster. And please don't ask me to pronounce this <laughs> the last name. I would no just task. really trip over my tongue. Let me see, it's Symphytrichium novi anglii. So that's, that's about the best I'm gonna be able to do for you today. Um, it is a perennial, and this particular plant gives us the, the gift of blooms in the late, late summer and early fall. Um, I am a floral designer, and I particularly like to use asters in floral designs because they're available late, and also they have such beautiful blue colors, which is hard to find in plants that we have in the Virginia area. Uh, they're also known as hairy Michaelmas mass daisy or Michaelmas daisies because their average bloom time is September 29th. Uh, they need uh, full sun to partial shade requiring six hours of di direct sunlight per day. And as far as water goes, they need moist soil and they're a good candidate for a rain garden. Um, good news for Virginia gardeners, they tolerate clay soil with organic matter. Here we come, Fairfax County. Moist soil with good drainage. Thank you for that information. Are, are they also native plants too? Do you yes, know? they are native. They're, they're native to the East Coast, mostly from the New England states down to um, probably zone eight is the, the, um, the source, you know, that, that is the tolerance for what they, where they can grow. Uh, zone three to zone eight. And okay. um, that, that gives you some idea of where they will grow. Um, the pest diseases, oh, 
the pest diseases and, and benefits. Um, the pests are spider mites and lace bugs that cause pale leaves with stippled appearance. Um, and like the hollyhock, uh, they are subject to aesthetic diseases that do not affect their life cycle, including rust disease and powdery mildew. The plants will blow, grow and bloom yearly in spite of the diseases. And um, benefits to wildlife, they attract butterflies, pollinators, small mammals, songbirds, bees, and are deer resistant. Lots of benefits. Lots of benefits. What are some recommended landscape uses? Okay, um, they are large plants. They grow three to three feet to seven feet tall, three to four feet wide. They need 12 inches to three feet for spacing between them. Some varieties are smaller and can be used for borders. These normally would grow about um, 18 inches high. And for some reason, they are the ones that have the darkest colors. Um, when the growth stalls, you divide the plants in the spring, either cut them in half and replant or dig up the whole plant and divide into sections for planting. There are some trusted cultivars that have been tested in various laboratories and they're Harrington's Pink, Honeysong Pink, Wedding Lace and Purple Dome. Because they get so large, they may need stalking and in order to prevent this, you may want to prune them back in June to create stockier plants that don't need to be staked. Um, companion plants, they work well with other tall plants, such as ornamental grasses, rudbeckia, and coneflowers. Well, that's a pretty sight there. And here are um, Elizabeth's references. Are there any that you'd like to point out to folks? Well, I think that the University of, of Vermont has, has a um, monopoly on New England flowers. I, I have found so many good re uh, references from the University of Vermont Extension. And so you might, may want to think about going there first if, when you're looking for information. And I also like the Grow Native um, database, plant database, because it helps you identify what you're looking for there. That's a good re uh, general re reference as well. All right, well, great. And since you mentioned um, uh, your companion plants here on your last photo, you mentioned uh, Rebecca and, and coneflowers. I would recommend to our folks online that instead of cutting down your, um, your perennials after the first fall, that you save the seed heads for the birds because those are a great source of food throughout the winter. And um, the birds are especially fond of, of these two, um, Rebecca and, and, and coneflowers. So um, if you can, you know, try to save the seeds for the birds. All right, well, thank you, Elizabeth. That was lots of great information. And Leslie as well. So we are going to segue to questions submitted during registration. And we have a lot of good suggestions here. Okay, questions submitted during registration. And is Megan on, on the line today? Well, her question was, what are some shade loving pollinator plants? And Leslie, could you um, answer these questions? Could you provide uh, go through through these some suggestions for that. Sure, I I got these from uh, plantnovanatives.org. They have a they're a great resource for um, native uh, plants and pollinator plants that um, uh, and they put it in a format that's really easy to understand, like where to plant, what they need, uh, that type of thing. So. Um, but uh, I, I just kind of went through and copied the ones that were um, uh, shade to part shade. So um, the, this is one of the Whitewood Aster. Um, all asters are, are good for butterflies and uh, pollinators, but this is the Whitewood Aster. Um, and uh, that's a part shade to full shade 
um, flower too. And this is a, a hookra. I didn't realize we, there was a native hookra, but it, American alum root is um, one of those and it forms those really pretty um, green foliage first and then um, shoots up those white flowers, which attracts the small bees. Is that also known as bone flower? Because it kind of looks like that. Oh, I don't know. No, oh, okay. All right, well, they're gorgeous. So let's go to your next slide. Um, the next one is the dwarf crested iris. Um, again, that's a part shade to full shade and that one attracts bees. Um, and the false Solomon seal. Um, and that's another pretty one. I, the birds are attracted to the berries and that's a full shade plant right there. So um, I have a lot of shade. I'm gonna have to look for that one. It looks like it's also kind of tall. Uh, yeah, that one can get pretty, I think it's really bushy. Um, you know, and then it forms the berries, so. Right for pollinators. So, okay, your next slide. Uh, the Virginia bluebells, those are early spring. Um, if you go down by the, um, the river, those are really common down there. They like the moist soils um, and they attract the early pollinators. Um, and those are so pretty. Um, and then the golden ragwort um, is full sun to full shade. So that should grow almost anywhere. And that one attracts the butterflies and bees. All right, moving on. Uh, the cardinal flower is a full sun to full shade. And that one attracts, uh, my friend of mine planted those and she had all these hummingbirds around it. It was really pretty. Um, and then you have the goat's beard, which is your part sun to full shade, which attracts butterflies. And is the larval host to the dusky azure butterfly. I was really excited this summer that I saw some cardinal flowers growing along our creek. So. I had never seen them before. Okay, to your final slide. Uh, the white turtle head, um, that's full sun to full shade, and um, that's a nectar source for butterflies. I do think that comes in other colors. I don't know if they're native or they're just a hybrid, but um, I know that comes in other colors. I have a pink yeah. version, so. I believe they're native. The season too, so. Okay, wow, that was awesome. I'm going to have to take a look at all of those and uh, and look at, at picking some of those for my shady areas. Thank you so much. So let's turn to our next question. Um, Kelly submitted this question. I tried to grow hollyhocks this year with zero success what to do. So Elizabeth, could you answer that question? Well, yes. Um, I began my presentation by saying that hollyhocks are a biennial and you have to be patient. You have to wait two years usually to get your plants. The first year they will, they will, they will sprout up and you'll grow lots and lots of foliage. And that is the energy that will propel their maturity into blooms the following year. Um, and I hope that it does answer the question um, in the event that this person has waited for two years to get hollyhocks and they didn't get any. I guess my answer is, I guess you're going to have to start over. So look into your growing conditions. Make sure that you have enough sunshine, which is absolutely essential to growing hollyhocks. And make sure that they have enough space in which to grow. Um, I would also like to add a comment to Leslie's presentation. I don't know if our audience is aware, but we do have a very lovely bluebell garden at the Bull Run um, Regional Park. And they open up the garden every spring and usually about two weeks in late April. And you can walk through the bluebells. It is absolutely breathtaking. And you might want to put it on your calendar for next year. I agree. I've been to River Bend Park and that's just gorgeous. So yeah, right along the Potomac River. So just all the bluebells as far as you can see. So um, Elizabeth, do the hollyhocks reseed at all? 
Well, you can have them reseed if you if you um, if you save the seed or if you just let the seeds fall down. Um, most most of the time, you just um, do not let them go to seed. You just remove them. But if you let the seeds fall, then they will reseed. And okay. then again, it will take two years. So until you have some blooms, be patient and and follow your follow your advice that you gave us today. So. All right. Well, thank you very much.